Presbyterian Church here in Crozet. We are a small community church who believes in bringing hope, each other hope, Christ to the community as well. And, and I think we're really exemplifying our small and community nature right now today, as all of us have had to come together uh, to, to get this going in various aspects today. Uh, for those of you on Zoom, welcome. Sorry for the late start, but we did get everything going. We're grateful for all of you to be here. Uh, I do want to note that uh, the lead team has agreed to leave the windows closed now. And so it is nice and warm and toasty in this room. Yes, my son's quite happy about that as well. Uh, everyone who is here knows about the worship guide, but if you are at home and forgot to, to go, you can go to the Hope uh, website and get access to the worship guide uh, as a PDF there as well. So let us uh, start uh, together after the singing I, through our call to worship. I encourage those of you who are able to stand up and join me in this call to worship. My heart rejoices in the Lord. He has made me strong. There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one beside you, Lord. There is no rock like our God. Let us exalt his name together. Join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, indeed, all glory, laud, and honor to you, our Father, who is the King. And Father, you are King who did not abandon us, but you are also love, and you displayed your love through your Son, Christ Jesus. And you provided us the ever present helper of your Spirit. And Father, this is how we observe you as Father, Son, and Spirit, one in substance. Praise be to you, our triune God. And now let us remain standing as we sing in worship. Thank you. 
may be seated. I invite Laura Ford to come up to do our New Testament reading. The New Testament reading is from Colossians 3, verses 12 through 17. Put on men as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, and patience, and patience. Bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, thanks be to God. God. We are continuing in the, the time that's recognized by the church as Epiphany. This is a time in which the light of God has been brought into the world. In Epiphany, we celebrate the revealing of Christ's light to the world, and we consider that the light of Christ is being revealed in our dark world. So you will notice that in the prayer of confession that we're going to be doing here, that this is an Epiphany confession. And together, we'll confess the places where we still allow ourselves to live in darkness. Let's pray. Father, we sin and either through foolishness or willful disobedience often choose to dwell in the darkness instead of live in your light. Lord, have mercy. We beg for forgiveness for starving ourselves of Jesus' life-giving light. Christ, out of mercy. We repent of our entrenched evil that hates the light and tries to dispose of it. Lord, have mercy. We admit our apathy towards sanctification and renewal that cause us to continue to live in the night. Trust in your grace, we cry. Create in us a pure heart, O God, and renew the steadfast spirit within us. Now let us pray silently. Just as confessing our sins and acknowledging that there is darkness in our life is one of the hallmarks of the Christian faith, so, so is the comfort and assurance that comes that knowing that when Christ said, it is finished on the cross, that spoke to us, to our hearts, that it is finished, that the darkness, that we do not have to live in it, and that light awaits us. And so I encourage you, brothers and sisters, what can wash away our sins? Nothing, Nothing but, but the blood, blood of Jesus. Jesus. We are brothers and sisters through his blood. We, we have died together. We will rise together. We will live together. I encourage you all who are able to rise in body and in spirit. We were dead because of our sins and because our sinful nature was not yet cut away. 
then God made us alive with Christ. So he forgave all our sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us. And he took it away by nailing it to the cross. Remember the good news of Epiphany. Christ, the light of the world, has illumined our hearts. In Christ, we are children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. Christ has given us peace. Now share that peace with each other. The peace of the Lord be with you. And I'm also with you. Peace be with you, everybody. Good morning. It always gets okay. I have okay. to off my eyes. Oh, yeah, I should do that because I will not. Uh, Peace online. Peace. <laughs> Peace with you. Yeah. Yeah, in my mind. Oh, you know, doing yeah, you know, reading the things like creeds and stuff. I'm just like that. It's a kid. It didn't say Jake. I didn't look at it. It's still on my mind. <laughs>
please be seated. Now is the time in the service where Todd usually takes over. But uh, as you may have noticed, Todd is not here today. He and Laura uh, went to a conference uh, down in New Orleans, and I believe they're uh, visiting family in Houston as well. We'll have some more family time as some of the other changes that will be happening in the service, but this is a time of tithes and offerings. There is a tithe uh, basket in the back, but we do encourage you to give online as well. If you do write a check, make it up to Trinity Presbyterian Church. But until we get particularized, that's what we'll have to do. And also continuing the worship, the uh, time of tithes and offerings, it is our custom here at Hope to pray in a, uh, a prayer. Today we have an epiphany prayer to offer not just our money, but our entire selves. So please read with me in response, our prayer of tithes and offerings. Lord, you were born in a simple stable and received gifts from the Magi. We accept our gifts, ourselves, our time, our money, and our commitment. Amen. Amen. Now, in family time, as I mentioned, uh, Todd is not here. We were going to have a uh, guest preacher, Ben Spivey, who is the Reformed University Fellowship leader from uh, uh, li at Liberty. Uh, he was not able to make it, and so we have a extra special guest speaker all the way from Johnson Village uh, <laughs> will be preaching for us today. Jim, at last minute, is coming up to do that, so I appreciate that. Some other uh, family time. I believe that the uh, SNF Sunday Night Fellowship for the youth group today, they will be doing at Trinity a Super Bowl party from, I think, 7.30 to 9.30, 6.30 to 9.30. Uh, so for those of you interested in doing that uh, and going to SNF for the, the, the youth, uh, that's what will be happening. Uh, it says here that the stated community group uh, meeting today at one minutes only. If that's the case, I sure hope that's uh, that's true. Uh, I don't have anything else written down, but are there anything else going on in the community or family uh, that should be announced? All right. Well, seeing none, let us move on to the prayers of the people. Uh, we have a response, uh, responsive prayer right here, and I will follow that with a short uh, intercessory prayer, a uh, pastoral prayer as it were, from up here, and then we'll continue on to our Old Testament reading after that. So please let us lift up to the Lord our concerns and cares. Oh Lord Jesus Christ, you have brought all nations to hear your voice. We pray for your church. Jesus, in that wisdom, which you revealed to the Lord. Grant us your Holy Spirit, that we may always seek you and your kingdom. Enable us to follow your holy word as those from the east follow the leading of a star. Give us grace at all times and in all places to confess your holy name. Rule us by your spirit so that the joys of your earth May Hear our prayers and prayers. Yes, dear Heavenly Father, we pray that just as the Magi were seeking you, we know that there are many people in our community who are looking for truth. And they're coming from a very different background, a very different approach, and yet they feel the need and longing. So, Father, we pray that you open our eyes that we may see those in our family, those in our community, and those in the world who are seeking you. And may we be the voice and the heart and the hands to lead them to you. We know that there are those seeking light in this world. We know that there are those suffering. So Father, open our eyes and our hearts to those in our families, in our church, in our community, in our world that need your help. Show us opportunities to serve, Father, just as you serve. To feed not only with food, but with the living word that comes from you and your heart, Father. 
we know that there is darkness around us. May you strengthen us by your spirit to be light to a dark world, salt to a rotting world. Father, we pray this all for your glory. Each one of us can think of those that we know who are hurting, who are suffering, who are in fear. And Father, we all lift them up to you right now. Those prayers and those people that are groaning and do not even have the words to say, Father, we pray for them. And we pray this with confidence, for we know that you are the great healer. You did not even spare your own son, but suffered greatly so that we may live. So we have the confidence knowing that as we lift these prayers up to you, that you will answer them for your glory and the good of your kingdom. And it's in your glorious name that we pray. Amen. 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 So let us now bring our attention to the Old Testament readings. The Old Testament reading is from Genesis 2, 5 through 25. When no fish of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground, and the mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is the Pishon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold and the gold of that land is good. Delam and Onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is the Gihon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Cush. And the name of the third river is the Tigris, which flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock and to birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked, and we're not ashamed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. 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 As I mentioned earlier, we have an extra special guest preacher today. Uh, I have instructions for how to introduce Ben Spivey, but Jim Anderson is a man who needs no introduction because he's been so dear uh, to our church right here. But we do need to pray. Uh, that the Lord would open our hearts. We will sing that, but also uh, I just want to take some time to pray also for Jim, who had this thrown on him at the last minute, that we all know that it is the Lord speaking to us, and that's never more obvious than when you have to do it at the last second. Speaking from personal experience as well, the Lord does speak, and so let us now pray. Lord, we do pray that you speak, that it is your word that we do not rest on our own understanding, 
but that you, O oh Lord, speak to our hearts and open our eyes, Father. And now let us sing this prayer as well. my sermon. Um, good to be with you this morning. Um, we're going to be looking at Philippians 4. And so uh, if you uh, have a Bible, you can turn there. Hear the word of the Lord. So then in this way, my dearly beloved brothers, my joy and my crown, stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. I urge Euodia and I urge Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord always, I say it again, rejoice. Let your good sense be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Don't worry about anything, but in everything through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses every thought, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any moral excellence and if there's any praise, dwell on these things. Do what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me and the God of peace will be with you. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you. In this text, um, Paul's doing some things that are kind of interesting. It, it kind of leaves you with a tension. Because on the one hand, he's giving you some instructions, giving us some instructions about the Christian life, living the Christian life in the world. And there are things like, for instance, back in verse one, uh, he talks about standing firm in the Lord, uh, which means our, our faith must be contested in some way. He talks about living in harmony with one another because... That must assume that we have difficulties with that, that we don't always get along. He also talks about a settled sense of well-being, um, and he'll refer to it in terms of joy or shalom, which is peace. And he commends that to us as if maybe we are not so. Oftentimes we live in a context where we're not so. And then he talks in the instruction that's kind of interesting where he says, be sensible and tolerant. And this is primarily in the New Testament to outsiders. So this is saying, this is the disposition you have or, or to have towards those who are outside the faith. And so we must assume that he's telling us this because we might be prone to a certain irrationality or combativeness when we're dealing with people outside of the faith. On the other hand, so he's talking about things and giving instructions and speaking into contexts that are definitely problematic and bring up tension and struggle for Christians. And he talks to us about how to live in that. But at the same time, this passage is telling us about things like joy and peace. Like it's possible for us to live in these contexts with, uh, with a certain sense of well, you know, a subtle sense of well-being and a certain confidence or joy, even though we may be in a, in, in a context where our faith is always contested. Um, we don't get along oftentimes. Um, we're not settled, oftentimes far from feeling settled. And, you know, we're prone to this kind of combativeness when we're talking to people who disagree or are, are outside the faith. So we have this tension. So I want to talk about that. And you know, what it might mean to live in that in relationship to Christ. So let's pray. Father, I thank you for your goodness to us and for your work as always. 
speaks to us. Your Holy Spirit works your words out into our, into our lives so that we can see your presence. And we increase our belief in your promise as we, as, uh, we experience your word. Uh, bless us now as we struggle with your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Most of you are probably really self-aware and uh, you just kind of know yourselves and know I I'm one of those that thinks one of the big gifts of the Lord to us is the gift of denial, self-denial. Because I have that in, in pretty big forms. Like the other day, I don't know why it was, and this isn't news to me or Cindy, but I turned to her and, and, and said, you know, I'm not really an anxious person, am I? She looks at me like, what? Like, when aren't you? Um, and I, I, you know, I just don't think that's true, that I'm a nervous person. <laughs> or that I'm anxious. So I'm talking about peace and talking about a sense, settled sense of well-being, knowing well that, um, that I personally struggle to find that zone. Maybe you do, maybe you're uh, more even killed, but even then the world we live in brings us into context, into situations where, you know, we need something from the Lord, some gift from the Lord in the way we live these things out. I think the four most important words in this text are not any of the instructions. I think it's important that we stand firm in the faith. I think it's important that we get along good instructions. I think it's important that we uh, work toward a settled sense of, of well-being. I think it's important that we're uh, sensible and tolerant in the way that we deal with others, especially those outside the faith. But I don't think any of those instructions as, they are, as important that, as they are, are the key words in this text. Anybody think of what they might be? Or in Greek, it's actually three. The Lord is near. Paul's going along as an instruction. It's almost like he stops for a moment and just throws that in. Oh, do this, do that. Here's what to think about that. Oh, the Lord is near. It's kind of like when you're having a conversation um, with someone you love and you're going along and you're just talking about something and right in the middle, you just stop because you have this sense of, you know, that kind of comes over you and you just turn to the person you love and you say, you know, I love you. I, I just love you. And then you go back to talking about whatever you were talking about. In that whole thing that you're, that whole conversation you're having, it would be very easy to isolate and stick on that one thing. Because in that one little phrase, you've said more than anything else that you've said. And I think that's what happens here. Paul's giving instruction, but he, he puts this little phrase in there, the Lord is near. And that's really what undergirds everything in the text. That's really, he opens a window for a moment for us to see really what, what's important. Now, this little phrase, the Lord is near, is translated uh, at least two ways in the New Testament. Like if you read some of your translations, you'll see that it's translated, the Lord is near. What's being emphasized is kind of this proximity, like he's near to us and in our lives. It's also translated often about half the time in the New Testament, it's translated a different way. And it would be like the Lord is at hand, which means he's coming again for us and that coming is is near so <clears throat> whether it's a, a spatial reference the lord is near or a temporal re uh, reference the lord is at hand this text could be interpreted either way uh, i would like to interpret it by taking both i think paul when he uses the word angus he knows uh that it can mean both things. And I think he, both things are at stake. Paul's talking in this little phrase about two gifts that he's given us, that Christ has given us, has spoken into the context in which we live and into our hearts and into our church as we gather together. And he's basically saying, um, I have given you the gift of my presence. I'm near. 
and I've given you the gift of my promise. I'm coming again for you. And those gifts of presence and promise sum up so much of what is powerful in our lives as we face these contexts of, you know, our, our faith being uh, uh, challenged, uh, not getting along, having the trouble with, with that or not being feeling subtle, which we have so many things in our lives that bring that about, or, you know, just having a real difficult time dealing with, with people that we just don't think are in the same space as us in terms of faith. Into those contexts, we have these two gifts till as we live out our lives. We have the promise of the presence of Jesus with us at all times. And we have, uh, or that he's coming for us soon. And then we have the presence of Jesus, which, which basically tells us he is with us and he's never departing from us, not individually, not as a group. We have those two gifts. So I wanted to look briefly at both of those. Um, the Lord is near. So the Lord is near. He's present with us. He's every, ever present with us. Um, you know, he gave us this promise. He gave the promise to the, to the apostles um, in John, where he said that uh, I will be with you uh, forever. Um, you know him, he says to the, to the Christians, you know him because he remains within you and you remain within him. And he says, I'm coming to you. I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I will be with you to the end of the age. That's what Jesus told the disciples. That's what he told his church. That's what's true for us. Um, and Paul's clear on it. You know, as we've seen, he's all giving all these instructions. He's not like talking about just having a joy or a peace or a sense of well, a sense of well-being. Uh, just kind of like, why don't you gin that up? You know, why don't you kind of, you know, get after that, obey that, and just kind of work it up. No, he says, the Lord is present with you. He, he's present with you as, as you as you wrestle with things that are real, like instability, conflict, and despair, and combativeness. He is with us. He is present with us to help us figure those things out. Um, now, Paul could, when he talks about the presence of Christ with us, he could talk about a number of things. But he turns to prayer. Notice he says, don't worry about anything, but in everything through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And then he says, somehow in that, doing that sort of thing, the peace of God which surpasses every thought will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. It's almost like it's not the resolution of your circumstance. It's the actual ability or the actual opportunity to turn to Christ in the spirit in whatever situation you're in and pray. And somehow in the process of praying, it's kind of a mystery, right? Somehow in the process of being, of real, of sensing Christ's presence and pray, and it just doesn't all, you know, snap like that, but that process over time results in a kind of sense of well-being, kind of a more of a subtle sense about where we where we're at in life. And it comes basically by experiencing the presence of Christ um, in the context of prayer through the Spirit. Paul probably could have gone to other places to talk about this, but it turns directly to prayer. It's that point where you get where I, I've had these experiences where at night, when I lay my head down on the pillow, especially during a really difficult set of circumstances, and as I begin to pray, I've experienced that sense of settledness come on as I go, go to sleep. And it's not about the resolution of anything in my life, anything about the situation, nothing about those things. It's simply the act of experiencing the presence of Christ through prayer and connecting with that through prayer. And over time, the reason why we emphasize that is we do it daily or on Thursdays, we do it as a church. But the reason why we emphasize that is that we really believe that as we enter into prayer, and it might take us a, a while to get into the posture of praying with the Lord, we actually encounter and, and, and connect with the presence of Christ in a way that brings, over time, brings peace. 
You're in a different place. Um, so that is a gift that we're given. This isn't something you work up or somehow you make happen. It's a gift of, that Christ has given us, his presence, that we have the privilege of accessing in many ways, but especially Paul is bringing out, we connect, we connect with the presence of Christ through prayer. So that's the first gift, the peace or the presence of Christ. And as we pray, the peace of, of Christ that comes into our lives. The second thing I wanted to talk about is the second gift is the promise, is the gift of Christ's promise. Um, he's not only present with us, but he is coming again for us. He's promised that. And the gift of uh, the gift of, pres of the presence of Christ is a beautiful thing. Uh, but it is it is it is not um, it's beautiful, but it's not complete. Um, there is a promise to us that that at one day the presence that we experience with Christ in our in our individual lives, in our families, and as 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 a church will become perfected. We will experience the, the presence of Christ perfectly. That's kind of the promise. There's kind of a realization right now. We're in this in-between spot where we have, we live in a context where faith is contested. We don't get along. We're not settled. We're combative. We have all these things going on. And many times peace is fleeting. But as we experience the presence of Christ through prayer, peace begins to dawn on us in an increasing way. And, um, and we begin to believe uh, in an increasing way in that in the presence of Christ in our lives, we we doubt it less because we're connecting to Him and and with Him and, and connecting in His presence. And but we have all these other things going on. But there is this promise that Christ is coming again for us. So we look at the world differently. Uh, we look at the world differently when we know that that we're in this middle space. And that Christ eventually will come for us and his you know, life and his presence will be perfected. So that means that we can look at the world in a different way. Paul talks about it this way. Whatever's true, you know, whatever you come across that's true in the world, um, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any moral excellence, if there's any praise, dwell on these things. It's almost like because Christ is coming again for us and we know that his presence will be perfected for us. And we can go to Revelation 21 and read about it, uh, what that's going to be like. We can look at all the things in the world that are good and true and honorable and our perspective changes. Those things become bigger to us because we know they are signs of what is to come in perfection. And so what we do is uh, instead of being like contesting, you know, all things in the world, we basically have a different position and a, a different perspective that by faith, because of, because of Christ's promise, we can look at, at the world through, through the promise, through the future and say, these good things we value, we enter into them, we enjoy, we praise, uh, and we contemplate them uh, we contemplate the good because we know that it connects to the perfected presence of Jesus in our lives when he comes again for us. So this is a gift that we have. It's another gift. The promise is a gift. It's not something we gin up. Um, it's something that Jesus brings to us, his presence, his promise. And they make all the difference as we try to live out our Christian lives and we try to respond to the to the instructions of Paul, um, given the context we have, uh, these two gifts of Christ, the presence and the promise, increasingly, I believe, we need to be asking the question, what does it mean? What would it mean for us as individuals and as a church, as a collective group, if we were increasing in our belief in the reality of the presence of Jesus and its, and its gift to us, and the things that it brings to us, peace, more of a sense of settled well-being, 
you know, what would it be like if our, if our belief in that was increasing? And our belief in the promise that Jesus will come back for us and there will be a perfected presence that we will enter into. If our belief increases in those things, it definitely uh, makes a difference in how we respond to the context we're in and how we live out life in light of what Paul is trying to tell us. So that's my uh, spiel for today is um, what would it be like to increasingly uh, to increase our belief. And I believe that in itself is a gift from God. Um, these things are very hard to do, just working them up. But what would it be like for us to pray for a greater sense of his presence and to enter into prayer as if Jesus were everywhere with us? Because that's what he said. I'm not leaving you in any way. I'm here by my Holy Spirit. When you take communion, when you listen to the word, when you gather together in fellowship in any way, when you're with your families, when you're alone in the middle of the woods, um, I'm with you. My presence is here. And there's no law or nothing that can that would prevent you from turning to the Lord in prayer at any point in time, and connecting with his presence. And you may not feel like, oh, there's an immediate uh, surge of, of, of well-being. But over time, as we practice that, over time, as we practice the presence of Christ, it will have a tremendous impact and bring about a certain peace among us and empower us basically to live a lot of the things that Paul is saying. And as we, um, so we have the presence of Christ, which basically invites us to prayer, which brings about a certain um, peace, which I, I translate peace, shalom, as a subtle sense of well-being, where there's not a lot of division in your mind and heart. Um, there's more of a unity in your heart. Um, that, that comes. So presence, the gift of presence, the activity of prayer, the posture of prayer, and the peace that comes with that over time. And then we have the promise, which grants us a different perspective. And from that perspective, it brings about over time um, as we view the world in a certain way, um, we find a peace there as well. You'll notice in the text, at the end of the conversation about presence or about prayer, he says, the peace of God which surpasses every thought will guard your hearts. And in verse 9, he says, and the God of peace will be with you. So this sense of the sense of shalom is a result. It results from both, both of these gifts as we attend to them, the presence of Jesus among us and the promise of Jesus to us. He is ever present with us. He is coming again for us. Amen.
church. In both the Bible and in our words, we refer to us as a family. Though we might not all be blood related in the traditional sense, we are all related through the blood of Christ. And our faith in it will cover our sins. There might have been a little bit of false advertising in the last verse of that of that hymn we just sang because uh, the table is not spread right now. We, uh, we uh, do not have the uh, clearance, as it were, to do communion today together. But we still have the opportunity to proclaim our faith together, the faith that unites us in this family. If this is not your faith in this uh, response from the Apostles' Creed, you, you don't have to say it. Uh, but for those of you who call yourself a Christian and unite yourself with the church going all the way back to when this was first written, uh, then please read with me. Christian, what is it that you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, in the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So let's stand together. Let's take the other three verses from the song that we just sang.